Hello, this is Reza Susabi, and with my colleague Chuck McCauley, we would like to present our novel covered communication scheme that explodes broadcast signals in LTE, 5G, and other technologies. I would like first uh, give a little introduction about ourselves. Um, uh, the application research team lead at Keysight ATI Research Center. I do open research on uh, 5G RAN security and develop algorithms to both make or break awesome things. I come from math and signal processing background, so try to apply them, them to new problems as much as I can. And typically I happen to be at the right time and in the right place. So I have been breaking things and triggering rare events uh, for fun when I become a dad. And now I love spending time, time with my toddler son. So I would like to turn to my colleague, Chuck. Hi, I'm Chuck McCauley. I'm a principal security researcher at the ATI Research Center at Keysight. Um, my hobbies include skiing and breaking my Land Rover and fixing it pretty frequently. At Keysight, I'm involved in new product initiatives and bring a long 20-year cybersecurity background to everything Keysight works on and touches. Uh, I really would like to expand uh, on the ambitions and the thoughts behind this research. Uh, to encourage future research, I believe this is as important as the research I'm presenting here. Uh, as my father always put it, um, talking about fishing is more important than talking about fish itself. So I had some past academic research experience in wireless security. I published my work on IoT security in IEEE in the past. So most of my work was deep in theories and math. So I decided joining industry to explore more practical problems out there. And I was offering R&D consulting services to mobile operators and was a 5G system engineer a while before joining Keysight in 2018. Uh, without being officially in InfoSec, I always had the tendency to break things around for fun and curiosity. So my new job at ATI enabled me to explore new ideas, less lesser known in wireless community, most notably protocol tunneling techniques that are used for data exfiltration. I was converging kind of my past and present experiences that one day in fall 2019 or cool bus, uh, invited me to take a lead in a 5G security research project and got me a lab with a super expensive uh, baseband emulator in there. So with that level of trust that he vested in me, um, I decided to go after a all-day vulnerability discovery other than simulating existing ones. So I discovered this vulnerability in 5G and LG standards uh, the following winter, and we successfully disclosed it with GSMA. Things kind of went slow. Um, due to pandemic and my parenting leave. Uh, but um, after watching this interesting talk in last year DEF CON on eavesdropping uh, satellite signals, I got really excited and pumped uh, to uh, put this work together and present it for DEF CON this year. I took a holistic approach of organizing the existing work in the biggest possible picture, or I call it a box, and then discover a hole in it. So I realized that covert communication is um, the biggest umbrella that I can put all techniques for data exfiltration, command and control, and other means of communications, unauthorized communications, uh, together in it. So it's usually regarded as a potential threat and taken seriously in the context of defense in depth. When I survey literature related to covert communication or topics related to it, I realized there are two dominant viewpoints that are coming either from hackers or uh, wireless engineers. So people with hacker mentality, um, like Chuck, <laughs> have targeted software protocol stack most of the time. So like message tunneling in L3 to 7 protocols, such as ICMP, DNS, and et cetera, a lot of cool techniques there. Uh, they have barely looked below IP layer, in fact. Uh, as we know it, uh, the security industry has actively been monitoring the research in this every area. So they track and block malicious IP traffic using boxes like IPSs, IDSs, and lawful intercept. On the other hand, wireless engineers such as myself are really fascinated with the beauty of radio systems, internals, and physical layer. So there is a huge literature on coding and modulation techniques to build optimal radios for covert communication. Uh, these techniques usually involve low power communication and avoiding spectral monitoring systems. 
So devices such as like LoRaWAN, ham radios, and other low power technologies can be kind of retrofitted and used for covert communication. But their operational range dramatically degrades when both sender and the receivers are at low altitudes, uh, where the signal, in fact, is blocked by buildings and foliage. Looking at the protocol stack, um, I thought of a new viewpoint, come up with a new viewpoint that combines both mentalities. So I come up with this question, how about exploiting the Mac layer protocol weakness in existing wireless infrastructure? This was the big question that inspired this work. It leads us to a new scheme that can be more effective than existing ones in, in many aspects. Uh, at this point, I was almost certain that I can find some simple example quickly in LTE and 5G standards because I was uh, very familiar with them. So very related uh, to the theme of DEF CON 29, I developed a framework to exploit the unstoppable signals from cellular base stations that are everywhere. So height is what makes the RF signals unstoppable. And operators spend big money uh, to mount antennas on tall comm towers, or recently some companies are trying to uh, fly them on low orbiting satellites. And this is all about getting more and more coverage to as many users as possible. So let's look at this scenario uh, that we're going to be using moving forward. So Trudy has intruded a secure air-gapped building with a programmable device. Uh, so she would like to send a message to her friend Ricky with a passive sniffing device sitting somewhere a few miles away, uh, like these anime geeks, geeks that we have uh, down below this frame. <laughs> In the picture, there is no radio signal path between them due to buildings and foliage. So, however, both can send and receive signal from a nearby cellular tower. So, what if Trudy sends a special low power uplink signal that triggers high power broadcast signals from the tower that then are received and decoded by Ricky? So simple, right? So, this will create a virtual covert communication channel between Trudy and Ricky. And this is basically the description of the technique that we are going to present here. Putting it simple and memorable for you, uh, we are creating, in fact, a reflection that are observable everywhere around the cellular tower. That's the key idea. So think of a Batman movie. They did not know where Batman is, right? So they were reflecting this light beam of the sky to make it visible everywhere so that you can see it. So, I would like to go and start uh, talking about the example that I discovered in uh, LTE and 5G standard. So let's take a look, take a look at the in protocol stack. Uh, what is the MAC layer, and what what how to, what does that mean exploiting MAC layer? So in protocol stack, some initialization or handshake steps always happen within each layer before it starts responding to data from the upper layers. This is how protocol stacks crank up, always from bottom to the top. So this work is related to the layer two in OSI model, often called the MAC layer. And from operating system perspective, this layer is whatever layer that enables devices to send IP packets. So they don't care what happens in it. They just look at it as an interface or gateway to send IP packets. In order to understand what we are talking about today, it helps to understand the analogous version of what happens when you connect an Ethernet cable to a switch. Right when you plug in your cable, before you get a green light on your switch indicating your uh, link speed and duplexing, a protocol negotiation has already taken place. The radio signals have synced up and found a signal in both directions. So there are some messages such as like a rate auto negotiation that happen very early that people normally do not care about them or observing them in their packet captures. So let's now talk about uh, the LT and 5G Big Mac layers. Uh, something more delicious, right? Uh, so this hairy arm man is searching for signal in the middle of nowhere. So when he finally gets a signal, uh, before he's allowed to send a selfie to Instagram about his situation, he tries to attach to a cell tower, right? And see if it allows to access it uh, that mostly involves SIM card voodoo stuff. 
uh, the apps running on his phone only care about sending IP packets to the internet, right? So the apps do not care about whether it is Wi-Fi or LTE or what happens inside these protocols, neither. So they see all these voodoo stuffs happening below IP layer as a big Mac layer. That's what I call it, a big Mac. Uh, they do not care what's in it. They just enjoy using it or what it delivers. The commercial wireless infrastructure has many components, uh, such as cell towers and a bunch of core network servers whose job is managing millions of users across a wide area. This big Mac layer that we're talking about in cellular standards uh, has several sub-layer protocols in it, like a big Mac, right? Uh, they define the interaction of user device with various components of the operator's network, but not the internet. So this is Big Mac is called control plane as well, or sometimes the people who built this network, uh, they call them layer two and three. In the context of LTE and 5G in particular, uh, related to our talk today, these standards are made by a global organization called 3GPP, for your information. It uses a protocol known as the RRC or radio resource controller, uh, which is an access protocol that is the toughest layer of this Big Mac, or you can call it the bond layer. <laughs> that works like more like a radius or messages in it looks more like a SNMP. But this is not what this talk about today. Uh, this talk today about is uh, the link establishment for RRC protocol. Uh, the very initial Mac layer handshake uh, that happens very early on before establishing an RRC connection. Uh, this is what this call is about. Think of it like a handshake between a phone and a cell tower before all other handshakes. And it has some interesting features to it that we are going to explore. And in fact, it does not travel to the operator's core network, making it suitable for covert communication. Some simple terminology notes in here. Um, so essentially, in the context of uh, LTE and 5G, we call all the devices that interact with the cell towers uh, UE or user equipment, whether it has a SIM card or doesn't have a SIM card, doesn't matter. And there is another more important terminology notes that I'm going to talk about here is that um, the story of a node B. So in LTE, they call these cell towers or base stations E node B. In 5G, they start calling them G node B. And um, actually, when I was talking about 5G with Chuck, Chuck said that what happened to the F node B. And I said, interesting, nobody uses F node B. So I decided to use F node B here uh, throughout the following presentation to refer to both LTE and 5G. So random access procedure is a common functionality in wireless Mac layers. So there is a small set of signals called RATCH that are reserved for the UEs connecting to an F node B for the first time. See, F node B. <laughs> All the uh, F node Bs respond to the signals regardless of device type or identity, even if it doesn't have a SIM card. The diagram here shows the normal RRC connection procedure. There are four uh, plain text messages exchanged between the UE and the F node B before the UE creates an authenticated session with the core network. Uh, these messages serve similar purpose to the Ethernet auto negotiation handshake, which is setting up synchronization. Uh, first, UE randomly sends a scramble signal from the RATCH set. And then F node B responds with more out of parameters that helps the UE to fine tune its uh, framing synchronization. Uh, but these are not the important ones. The important ones are the message three and four. They enable the F node B to resolve resource contentions between UEs that are simultaneously attempting RATCH. Per standard, the UE should send a 48 bit string that contains a 40 bit random ID in it. Then wait for the F node B to broadcast message four. Uh, this string is called CRI or contention resolution identity. If the F node B replies with the same string in message four, it means that the UE can proceed with the RRC connection. Otherwise, it knows that someone else is supposed to go ahead and has this one has to stay and retry later. I think probably by now you've guessed What's wrong with this broadcast ping pong between message three and message four? So coming to the Trudy and Ricky's covert communication scenario, Trudy and Ricky can have prior agreement under target F node V and Trudy's RAC signal selection. Then Ricky is passively scanning and decoding message two and four from the F node B using its low power radio. 
Instead of including random 40-bit identity in CRI, Trudy can encode a short message in it and send it up, sending it up in message three. Uh, this message can include a signature byte indicating it is made by her, not by other users in the cell. Then Ricky can pick up and decode the same message from the FNOTB's message for broadcast that happens immediately after. Simple, right? Uh, this, this is a kind of like an illustration for a unidirectional channel, but essentially Ricky can repeat the same procedure to establish a reverse link to Trudy to kind of send information like acknowledgement. Looking at the history of this procedure, we believe that this vulnerability may exist in other wireless Mac layers as well. Uh, this particular example has been in LTE and 5G for over a decade, but no worries. I will share at the remediation before this talk ends. So exploiting a little bit, expanding on how, uh, what they can gain by using Sparrow. A Sparrow UE can break long messages uh, into uh, chunks of 40-bit messages and send them in multiple ratch attempts. Successive ratch attempts do not have much impact on other users uh, in the cell. And there is a back off also timer that's built into the standard document, as you can see the, the snapshot right below, uh, that the UEs have to basically pick up a random value uh, as a back off timer, but it's all been left to the use discretion and the E node Bs or F node Bs do not have any way to enforce it. So picking a back off time like a 10 milliseconds, um, usually the message one to four exchange takes on average of like a 30 milliseconds. So in total, this can give uh, Trudy a one kilo BPS throughput a link to reach messages to Ricky. Uh, very limited, but it's still comparable to other low power technologies like LoRa. Outdoor uh, LTE and 5G base stations operating at, at lower frequency bands, particularly below two gigahertz are more suitable for a spower technique, mainly because their signal can reach up to five miles and also they can reach indoors very well. Uh, 5G new radio, and you reduce some new frequency bands above six gigahertz uh, that they involve lots of RF voodoo stuff like a beam forming uh, that making it difficult for Ricky and his followers down below uh, to decode and broadcast the signals. Uh, there is also a new satellite-based 5G standard uh, called 5G NTN, which is in development. Uh, that might actually give the UE, uh, Sparrow UEs uh, 10 times more mileage uh, hopefully, we can get our remediation built as a secure RAG option for that stand. Uh, so benefits of the, using the Sparrow are uh, really great. Uh, so you can uh, get really super stealthy with it. No network footprint because uh, messages are local to the F node B, and nobody is going to log the message, Mac layer messages uh, at the edge of their network. Also, the Sparrow UE activity is indistinguishable from the other UEs, so no radio spectrum footprint that's going to be there for uh, external passive monitoring systems to geolocate the, the transmitter. Uh, these are the reason I call them Sparrows. So no need for expensive equipment, right? So 100 bucks low power SDR can do the job. They can also leave off uh, rechargeable batteries or solar power. No need for high gain antennas since they get the rebroadcast power from the F node Bs, right? I will also show some more range expansion techniques uh, further in the presentation. So they can get higher range uh, per RF wattage in a cluttered environment. And that's a very key point compared to the other complex commercial radios like Walkie Talkie or LoRa. Uh, who cares about the sparrows? I mean, really, they are sparrow birds are everywhere. They're among us, right? Nobody cares about them. I know historically, uh, sometimes they cared about them for crops, but nobody cares about them. And this is the same with the Sparrow with regards to the, uh, cellular operators because they do not see any immediate impact on their network, so they do not care about it. And as a matter of fact, any temporary solution to block the Sparrows kind of lead to some performance degradation to real users, and we will talk about that. But the remediations that uh, we have developed um, has to go be implemented at the standard level. So, so far, the sparrows are unstoppable. So here, I'm going to actually uh, I'll turn the presentation to my colleague Chuck uh, to talk about our demo and show the demo and also talk more about the use cases for a sparrow. Chuck. Thank you, Reza. Um, 
So one of the benefits of working at an organization like Keysight is we get to play with a lot of cool tool tools. Um, even though we were in the middle of a pandemic, we were able to work with a lot of our uh, peers in different parts of the world and were able to convince the GSMA that we'd actually found uh, uh, a design flaw in the RATCH contention messaging structure. So what you see here is our demo lab that got set up for us uh, by our peers in Italy. At the bottom, you see something that we call a UXM. Now this device allows us to emulate a E node B, a G node B, and hopefully in the future, even an F node B. Um, and what you can do with this device is emulate a cell phone tower effectively. And at the top, <clears throat> you see uh, what we call UE SIM, which simulates whatever's gonna connect to a mobile network. Um, and allows you to play with the messaging structure and validate a F node B or G node B or E node B, right? Um, but what you can do is if you take both of these two test validation systems, you can put them together and build effectively a cell network in isolation and test out some theories. Um, in the lower right hand corner, you can see sort of a screenshot here of um, our test script that uh, enables our UXM to pretend to be a E node B doing the ratch contention messages. And in our next slide, um, well, not really a slide, in the next video that's coming up right here, uh, we're going to introduce our friend uh, Befakuda. Uh, Befakuda works out of Italy and uh, he has uh, put together a quick video demonstrating Sparrow working for us that we then presented to the GSMA. My name is Dovkar Dabur. I'm an application engineer at Keysight Technologies. In this video, I am going to demonstrate the proof of concept for the Sparrow project. With this AirMosaic graphical user interface, we configure UEA on ELSU A that's with an IP address of 1040.88.70 as a TX. Therefore, we set the mode as a TX and the random access preamble ID to 8. And the, mess, the plain text message to be sniffed by the receiver UE is said to welcome to the DEF conf. Similarly, we have set the UE P on ALSUB with an IP address of 10.14.88.157 as an RX. Therefore, we set the mode to RX and the random access preamble ID to on the current network side, the, fair, the PRT script activated the 5G NR standalone cell where the synchronization signal block is broadcasted via the EXM platform with a periodicity of 20 milliseconds. If the master information block is decoded with success on both uh, UE, so the cells will get sync and in service if the system information block type 1 is uh, decoded. Since both UE are in, in service, in, in sync and idle, we can connect the GUI to the layer 3 test manager and verify if the SIB is decoded, then the cell should get in service. We can run the scenario from the RX side first now and from the TX side. It seems that the transmitted message is with success on from the TX side and let's verify if the receiver UE side decode the message successfully. So from the scenario logger, here we have decoded that uh, the message welcome to the DEF conference. From the TX side, it can be verified that uh, the message too is uh, decoded with the valid RAR. Also on the RX side, uh, we can check The message too is decoded with the, the valid RAR as of uh, uh, 
tx ue if this is the case we can also verify the message through three is decoded with success first from the uh, tx side so here we can confirm that the ue contains resolution id is decoded with success on the tx side and let's see also on the rx side so on the rx side message tree is also decoded with success so since we have implemented a crc decoding if the message is decoded we can see the message on the rx side so as you can see here the message is decoded successfully welcome to the dev conf so there you saw befe showing us uh how you can bounce a message between two ues across uh, a cell phone tower um which is pretty wild so let's talk about what you could do with this sort of technique um a lot of the uh, applications are pretty obvious from the get-go but uh, one that we thought was pretty neat to highlight would be the ability to exfiltrate data out of a secure site um, there are cell phone towers that are doing these ratch procedures all the time so it'd be very hard for you to notice an additional ratch procedure occurring with a cell site uh, from a specific ue at a specific location um, uh, when you start thinking about the application layer and digging into data in there, you can either have a service provider or a government entity uh, intercept that communication layer and, and prevent it in multiple different paths. But at this low layer on the Mac layer, this is happening before any of those things occur. You could also use this to easily trigger events remotely, like opening a door and more drastically triggering a bomb to occur. Um, <clears throat> and you can be well within say five to 10 miles away from the site in the event that you're triggering, right? So that's a long distance to, to cover and figure out the source of the, the message. And lastly, this could also be part of a supply chain attack where you actually bake in some kind of remote control process into the device and then access it at a later date, right? Um, which is also a, a big risk these days with our vast and multiple country uh, supply chains that occur. But there's also good applications for this that are used for good. Um, if a tower loses its uh, uplink to the rest of the data network, it still can um, provide some use, whereas before it might have been just a, a thing that just sits there and waits until the connectivity is reestablished. Um, so this could be used for broadcast messages in case of disaster or emergency. Um, it could also be used to connect uh, uh, emergency personnel themselves to each other um, and tell them where help is needed or, or what needs to be done, which we think is uh, a really neat application of this in general. Um, and then lastly, uh, we think that there's a lot of opportunities for mischief here. Um, instead of using LoRaWAN or other uh, IoT-based low, low bitrate protocols, you could use uh, someone else's cell phone tower to provide the overlay network uh, for your IoT devices and then simply have one device that picks up all the signals and transmits them on an internet uplink somewhere. Um, you could also use this to help improve a pager network. Um, this device here, this doesn't use it. Uh, this uses LoRaWAN right now, uh, but it's made by Natural Freck and he uses it to pass messages back between different devices at Shmu and DEF CON. Um, you could easily hijack a cell phone tower and then you instead of having a mile or two of distance or a giant ugly antenna, you could just be passing messages with something a lot smaller and a lot neater. And now I'm gonna bounce it back over to Reza, who's gonna talk about uh, increasing the, the signal boost and some remediation. So in the case of LTE and 5G, this Sparrow use can exploit kind of like multiple uh, F node Bs. Um, Except uh, the very rural areas, uh, it is common for a Sparrow to have access to multiple LTE or 5G carrier signals in any area within range of a few miles apart when the UEs are not that much far from each other. So this can help them to essentially 
uh, establish uh, parallel communication channels and enhance their throughput uh, above like one kbps that we estimated. Another cooler way, um, actually, to for to use multiple cells is really to expand the range beyond a single cell radius coverage. Uh, like a beyond five miles. So for doing that, in fact, the Sparrow, you will need uh, to use uh, Sparrow relays. So Sparrow relays are dropped uh, basically where they can listen and transmit and interact with multiple cell towers. And their job is being Ricky in one cell and being acting like Trudy in the other cell, as you can see in here. So Sparrow relays can be small, uh, kind of like a solar powered devices that are dropped uh, in random places. So to be more specific, uh, LT cells are deployed in kind of like a hexagonal pattern to cover an area. So this picture that I'm going to show in the next slide is going to show how the relay nodes can be placed. As you can see in here, so you have a multiple ways in here to, uh, to place them. So you can actually place many of them in where the, the actual uh, sector coverage areas overlap and create a mesh network so every node can talk to every other node and relay messages. Or you can actually create a specific chain to expand the range uh, between two endpoints. But what is the remediation here? I mean, with all what we said here, what is the remediation? So let's just start before I get to the remediation. I think there is a value uh, to learn um, in case what is the general weakness model that has enabled the Sparrow in LTE and 5G and potentially it can exist in other protocols. So I kind of spent some time and have formulated this and possibly I'm gonna be publishing all this work uh, following the DEF CON, but to kind of give you a general idea about it, a wireless Mac layer protocol I found is vulnerable to a Sparrow technique. If any of its procedures allow forming two sets of uplink messages that I call M, and a downlink broadcast message, I call them B, that satisfy the following conditions. So the first one is a passive reception. So every signal in B or should be receivable and decodable everywhere. So it should be a kind of like an omnidirectional broadcast that any passive device anonymously can decode it. Another key feature is basically, we call it bijectivity, but it's a one-to-one -one relation between them. So essentially, if you have a set of 10 messages in each of them, each message B can only be triggered by a specific message that is in the set M. In other words, when a receiver receives B, it can almost surely assume that its intended transmitter has transmitted a specific message. So that way they can have uh, less error uh, during their communication channel. Another one, which is a key important thing, but it's kind of like optional, but it is a good important thing to have, and we have it right now in the example that I showed you in Sparo, is that anonymous uplink. So essentially the transmitting device doesn't have to attach to the network or authenticate to the network to be able to send uh, those messages, which actually we already constructed a message set, which is actually the CRI and that 40, 40 bit strings that they can pick are going to form or superset for set of messages that they can transmit. Another key feature down here, number four, is to being a stateless uplink. It is important that uh, the transmitter or Trudy can successively send any messages from M, set M, without protocol violation, as we talked about it, sending successive messages and you know, not caring about much about the back off in between them. So all these four conditions to, together, if they apply in any specific wireless MAC protocol, that means that some similar techniques to the Sparrow can be formed around it for covert communication. Any remediation to should preserve the purpose of CRI. So the, the, why we have this here, why we have that selective message three, message four, ping pong. Um, so as you can see, it's for contention resolution. So there's more details about that. So let's assume that two years these are picking up the same uh, RAT signals to attempt to E node B. So um, essentially at this point, E node B doesn't know there are two messages coming because of the properties of the RAT signal. Only one of them is going to make it to the E node B. 
So InnoP is going to send additional, basically, fine-tuning parameters for one of them. And But the point is, the message two, both of them are going to receive message two. So at this point, both of them think that they are succeeding. So at that's the point that F node B actually has to have a way to signal only one UE to proceed and the rest of them to back off. And that's the point that it requests every UE to send a 48-bit uh, CRI message. So, and then it's just going to rebroadcast the one that it has received. That is going to surely indicate that one UE is going to know it can succeed and the rest of the UEs are going to basically back off and retry. So before getting to the solution that works, I know maybe some of you already are thinking about uh, some solution ideas. So let's talk about them and talk about why they do not work. So what about like presetting CRI uh, font? Why, why the fonts have to randomly select them? What if we hard code all the fonts to like a, make it like a Mac, Mac address? So they have to use the same thing. There are actually some privacy concerns with that. Uh, there are already attacks in LTE and 5G uh, on privacy. And we have lots of techniques for catching people, phone numbers, and MZ. So any tying up, any fixed identity that can be broadcasted everywhere that can lead to uh, privacy issues for the users. So this is not like a Wi-Fi, which is a local network. It is a global network. Another one is shared secret. No, there is no shared secret between the UE and F B at this point because the, the, all the cell towers are required to do this interaction with devices even they don't have any identity or SIM card. So what about like a crypto hashing and salting, right? That's a to-go thing, crypto, the fun stuff. Um, that in fact doesn't work because um, first of all, if you think about message three and message four broadcast, uh, if the if the, the F not B tries to basically hash what it puts in the message four, so that the the designated UE can you know just check the hash or recompute the hash and compare it and proceed, and the rest of them are going to back off. Um, it has to basically, uh, even if it starts like using like a salting technique down here, which has the most sophisticated way to put it, even if it is using salting, it has to ship the salt string with the hash all together. But does it really prevent uh, Ricky and Trudy from exchanging messages? Not, not that much. It just makes, adds a little bit computational complexity to the mix. But in fact, the Ricky can still uh, recompute because it's going to have the hashing algorithm, it's going to have the salt, and it's going to be able to compute uh, these values for any set of known codebook messages that they decide to use, and they can just stick to that codebook. So it can slightly slow them down, but it's not going to solve the bigger problem. Also, the F node B cannot distinguish between the Trudy and the other users. So any attempt to blocking some of the signals, if they uh, repeat uh, successively, it is going to have a performance impact. So the, the actual users have to pay the cost. And as I've mentioned before, the operators are reluctant to take such necessary steps. Uh, so what is the real solution? Uh, this is the solution I put together to be proposed to the standard. So the remediation has to come to the standard level, which actually might have applications in other fields. I call it like a extensible loss-induced security hashing algorithm. Uh, what it does is just adding one layer of entropy over that salting and hashing that we were talking about it. So the, the first few steps are very similar. So we do some uh, salting. So that once, it once the F node receives a message three, it's going to apply salting um, and apply the crypto hash. Uh, right there, I kind of come up with a new salting algorithm called uh, random multiplicative salting. It's a kind of new algorithm that helps uh, uh, reduce the collision probability when you're using uh, crypto hash functions with short strings like CRI. Uh, and then after that, it starts applying some random erasure to the output of the hash function. So it decides to not transmit all the bits that come from the hash digest, but send randomly select a bunch of them and send them out in message four so that the intended UE can you know, essentially 
has to have all the information to repeat the same process and compare the output. And if it matches, it can proceed. If it doesn't match, it has to back off. So that means that the salt, in addition to the salt, we have to also ship uh, a basically a, a, a bit string that indicates that which bits we have selected and which bits we have not selected uh, from the output of the crypto hash all together uh, to the UE. So that's what I call it bit mask. As you can see, in this case, um, there are two advantages to this that makes it impossible for Trudy and Ricky to communicate. First of all, they cannot reconstruct. They might. They, they were reconstructing like a rainbow tables and and recomputing the hash for the uh, code book. But the point is that layer of the erasure that we put in between, they cannot uh, create a code book that both can be recomputed by a hashing algorithm and at the same time have error correcting feature and capabilities in it. So that kind of that having it, it enabling those erasures and you know errors in there in their communication is going to, to totally uh, reduce their chance to correct those errors. So that way their their whole communication scheme is going to fall apart. Another key point in here uh, to mention is about the cost, right? I mean, always there is there is no free launch out there. So that's the whole point in, in engineering is that whenever we're trying to improve things, we have to pay the cost. But is it the cost we are paying is the right cost? In this case, as you can see, significantly increase the number of the bits we are replying in the message for in stuff like playing by 48 bits. So in the example of like a MD5 hash, instead of playing back 48 bit, we might be playing back about like a 200 bits. But that's not a problem with LTE and 5G and the amount of like the bandwidth and resources that are available uh, for this. This is not going to be a big cost to pay really for, for preventing this. So as a matter of fact, what we are proposing here is going to be more of a optional secure ratch. So it doesn't have to be implemented everywhere across the network, but maybe the operators want to implement these uh, near some critical facilities and areas where they're requested to do so. So I would like to kind of get to the wrap up points in here. So I'm going to um, turn quick to Chuck to share uh, his concluding bits about the story. And he's been all along observing me working through this. So I would like to also share him to share his feedback with you. Chuck. Thank you, Reza. When Reza came to me and he talked about, I think I figured something out in the Mac layer and we can like smuggle messages in and out of a, a cell phone network. I was like, no, there's no way. Mac layers are boring. It, you know, the best way you can do with anything like that is, you know, get from port one to port two on a switch. But just because it's layer two doesn't mean that it's localized. And I think that's, that's something that I, I really sort of took away from all of this. Um, we also really don't think that LTE and 5G are the only systems that are vulnerable to these types of attacks. Um, if you just start digging around some of the Mac layer protocols that are used by satellites, there seem to be about 10 to 20 of them. Um, and that would give you a lot, a lot farther reach than uh, anything that's terrestrial based. Um, there's a whole host of other radio broadcast signals out there as well. Um, from 802.11 to Bluetooth to lower end to other things that can probably be abused in similar fashions. Also, just a note, LTE and 5G is now for everyone. Uh, with a budget of about the same as a gaming computer, you can buy enough equipment now to build your own LTE network and even the FCC's granted spectrum for you to go and play around with it in your own sort of private space, uh, which is pretty wild. So yeah, we, we'd like to also say thank you to uh, many people in our team, including Befe and Luca, and Reza would like to say thank you to a few others too. Yes, thanks, Chuck. Um, I think I'm going to thank Chuck for, for all the work and his support that he offered me uh, during the, the CFP process and putting all this talk together. And also uh, the ATI management staff, Chris, uh, Steve McGregory, the cool boss I mentioned early on that uh, who kind of like inspired me to go to this uh, all day discovery. And also I would like to thank our uh, Keysight IP program coordinator, Pete uh, Marisco, uh, that he did a great job of um, sticking to a very fast timeline so that I can share the remediation bits here with you team. And in general, I really thank DEFCON. It's been a really great experience for me. Uh, I really love to continue uh, being engaged uh, in the community. Thank you.